I'm here today with Peter Solomon, who's the CEO and founder of Peter J. Solomon Company, one of the first private investment banks on the street. And Peter, cannot thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with me today. Really, really appreciate it. Before we begin, what I always like to do is talk about what life was like growing up as a kid. Well, first, I'm glad to see you. We're Von Stadis, and I've known Von Stadis since 1956, so uh, I'm glad to meet another one. Uh, I grew up in New York City post-war. I was born in 1938, and I basically grew up in a very calm environment. I was at camp and remember vividly the end of World War II, VJ Day. Uh, we were all sent to camp at those days because of the fear of polio. Um, it was a very traditional um, sort of upbringing, middle class upbringing. Uh, we didn't worry too much about fear, although I was mugged amazingly on my way to my bar mitzvah lesson on Park Avenue and 86th Street in what must be 1950. So it wasn't a crime free world. We idolize it, but it wasn't crime free. But it was a calm world. Now, I graduated college in 1960. Interestingly, the only people who offered me a job were the CIA, and I always thought I should have taken it. It would have been sort of interesting. They offered it through a foundation, which was a front at that time, it turned out, for the CIA. Um, I went to Lehman Brothers because I decided, first I went to Bloomingdale's for a summer training program, and then I decided to go to Europe. And, and I uh, convinced Lehman Brothers through my father at the time to get me a job as a stagiaire at Paribas in Paris. So I went to Paris. And then I traveled for about six or nine months. It was a very interesting six or nine months. Led me to places like, by chance, I was at the Eichmann trial, for example, wow. in uh, 1961 in the summer in uh, Jerusalem. And I traveled around and then f ran out of ideas. Uh, I was basically trying to avoid the Harvard Business School, where <laughs> I, my father was, uh, uh, had convinced uh, himself that I should go there. My brother had gone there. He had gone there. Yeah. And I was trying not to go there. But I ran out of ideas. I actually went to Berlin uh, and was there just before the closing of the wall. Uh, there was supposed to be a problem in Berlin. And I said to myself, as every irresponsible 20-year-old would say, maybe I'll go find a war. Right. And so I flew into Berlin. I was the only person on the Pan Am plane from Frankfurt to Berlin in beginning of August 1961. It was clear to me, uh, regrettably, that there wasn't going to be a war, that I would not be uh, stuck in Berlin. I was trying desperately to find something that would keep me in Europe before the start of the Harvard Business School and, in fact, buy me another year of freedom. It failed. I was a total failure. I ended up at the Harvard Business School. And I take it you had a great experience there. No, I actually didn't like the Harvard Business School, <laughs> actually. I was right about the Harvard okay. Business School. I actually. Uh, I met wonderful friends, a, a couple of them are very, still very dear friends of mine. John McCarter, who, who's one of the top guys at the Smithsonian now, and John Keller. But I really t didn't like the Harvard Business School. Um, and in fact, wanted to quit after the first year. But my mother convinced me that everybody in the world would ask me why I had left the Harvard Business School after a year. And so I stayed. She told me to just go play golf and go do whatever I wanted to do, go fishing. And I did. That's what I did the second year of the Harvard Business School. So I went to, I graduated business school. But being very lazy, I didn't, I hadn't, I didn't interview any place else. So I went back to Lehman Brothers. That's how I ended up as an investment banker. Something tells me this man was not lazy. Well, I was lazy about employment. I just wasn't interested in, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what had happened to me. I was the last person admitted to my class at the Harvard Business School. I was on the waiting list. I was admitted sort of in August. But I had to get myself a, a room. So my uncle knew a professor who lived on Francis Avenue, which is some distance from Harvard Yard, uh, named Ben Seligman. And Ben Seligman had a lovely house next to actually uh, Galbraith and a bunch of other professors on Francis Avenue. And he said, thrilled to have Peter uh, stay with me. I have extra room and he could use the money as well. We paid him. He said, but I have a recluse living on the second floor, a professor, a man named Harry Wolfson. And he's sort of a strange fellow and, and I'm not sure how that will work out. Well, Wolfson was the great Harvard professor of, of uh, Spinoza and Maimonides and Socrates and Plato and had once written a book on the Church Fathers that had never been reviewed because the then Pope said nobody knew more about the Church Fathers than Wolfson. 
and he's a famous professor. And he and I became closest friends. And, and you were talking earlier about this professor with a beard. Harry Wilson was about 5'5", five five, didn't have a beard, but had an enormous amount of white hair. And in fact, when Esquire did an article on the natural superiority of the Ivy League, they used Harry Wolfson as an example of the superior intellect of the Ivy League. Wolfson and I used to travel. I, I mean, I would take him on dates. Uh, I took him to Wellesley once. He was a total recluse, but I would, I would take him with me. He never went with anybody. Anyway, I graduated, and I said to Wolfson, uh, Wilson said, what are you going to do as I thought about graduating? And I said, well, I really want to do something positive for society. Now, this is a man who uh, never married, uh, was virtually a recluse. Um, uh, he turned to me and he said, he was sitting in his office and he said, I said, you know, maybe I'll go in the social field or political field or something. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you want to do something for society? Go to Wall Street make a lot of money and you'll, and you'll do more for society using that money that you make on Wall Street than you ever will in either politics or in social welfare. And this is a man who you would never, never think that he would have that sort of point of view. Right. And that was very influential to me. Anyway, I ended up back at, I graduated Harvard College. I went to Harvard Business School reluctantly. I went to Lehman Brothers. And I stayed at Lehman Brothers for, um, until I went into the uh, Koch administration. That was from 1963 to 19, basically the beginning of 1978. And what drove that decision to go to the Koch administration? It's a very, it, first thing I was always interested in politics. Um, oddly, when I became deputy mayor, I was in 40. And I got calls from all these classmates of mine from Harvard College that said, I, we can't believe this happened. And I said, well, what, what, what happened? What can, you can't believe? He said, when you were in college, you said at age 40 you were going to go into politics. I said, I did? They said, oh, yeah, you all used to say it all the time. So uh, it was total serendipity. I did not know Ed Koch. I didn't particularly like him. I thought he was sort of a pinko at the time, frankly. He was very far left. He had won election, interestingly, on, on uh, the death penalty. Uh, he had been in favor, this was post-Son of Sam, and he had won a, the election on being, you know, for the death penalty, contrasting to Cuomo and others. Uh, I didn't think he had much of a chance of winning. He did win. Uh, I had met him a number of times, and we had argued every time I had met him. Um, I mean, we literally had argued. But I was, uh, my friend David Brown, who was the, sort of the first deputy mayor, called me, and he said, uh, Ed Koch, the mayor would like to meet you. And I said, well, why would I like to meet the mayor? Why does he want to meet me? He said, well, he wants to talk to you. And I said, well, I was a partner of Lehman Brothers. I was on the executive committee. I was 38 or 40. It was going pretty well. And I said, um, well, I really don't want to meet him. And after a little while, David said to me, look, I have to come down to get some cigars down near uh, Oh, he smoked these little cigars down near 1 William Street. Why don't you walk back with me? I'll come to the office. We'll walk back. I said, fine. Great, fine. I haven't seen you for a while. I'd love to do it. So we walked back, and we had a nice meeting with Koch. Went on for about 10 minutes. I don't know what he talked about. In the middle of it, he said, I'd like to become deputy mayor. I had no idea. I'd never been in City Hall. I had no idea there were deputy mayors. And okay. Pete Peterson really drove me becoming deputy mayor. I was working for Pete. Um, I would have turned down the job naturally uh, as a normal course. And Pete said, no, no, it's too important a job. Um, New York, if New York City goes bankrupt, we're all in trouble. You've got to take the job. He offered you a job to help in a critical time. You have to take it. And I said, oh, no, you're just trying to get rid of me. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you're trying to export me to government. He said, no, 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 you have to take this job. And, and so I took it. So, Peter, you were deputy mayor under the Ed Koch administration. What was that experience like? What did that mean? Ed initially had seven deputy mayors, which was a disaster. In fact, after a year or so, I really wanted to quit because I said to him, there are too many people here. They're all falling all over each other, and most of them don't know what they're doing anyway. And in fact, to Ed's amazing credit, not because I said it, he fired five of them. Uh, and um, we ended up with three deputy mayors. Uh, uh, Bobby Wagner, Nat Leventhal, and together with Diane Coffey and, and Jim Brigham, who was the budget director, it's actually the best group of people I've ever worked with. What 
What I nominally was responsible for was that anything that touched a job in the city of New York, mm -hmm. well, that's pretty expansive. And so some of the most exciting things I had to deal with were the gas and energy uh, crisis in the city. We, uh, in those days, we had gas shortages. I had actually uh, inadvertently discovered we were about to have a gas shortage because the federal government had reallocated gasoline to the West Coast away from the East Coast. Um, not only was the mayor terrific, but the governor was one of the great governors, Hugh Carey. At one point, Hugh Carey walked into my office and said, I'm appointing you the gas czar of the state. Yeah. First thing, governors don't walk into deputy mayor's offices, generally unannounced. Doesn't actually happen. And he appeared, and I looked up, and there was the governor. And I said, well, Governor, what are you doing here? It's sort of, are you lost? The mayor's upstairs. He said, no, I'm appointing you gas czar of the state. I said, what's that mean? He said, you're going to have total control over where gas is everywhere in the state. You have got to figure out the system. Of, we ended up figuring out a, an allocation system. And I said to him, you can't appoint me. Uh, I, I work for the mayor. He said, well, I'm the governor. I can appoint you to anything. So I went upstairs to the mayor with him, and I said, um, Mayor, the governor wants to appoint me gas czar, and you have to tell him he can't do it. And Koch, whom I loved, by this time I loved, he said, oh yeah, you can do that job too. You do that job too. You become the gas czar for the state, and you still become deputy mayor for the city. So it was just very, the best thing about government is crises. And when you're in New York City, you have a crisis every hour. I mean, the only time government is worthwhile is in crises. And the time that I'm critical of government, like the financial crisis, is when they can't function. Because the only reason they're there is for crises. When they're not crises, nobody needs government. We would do very well without it. And so when government, like Paulson said in the financial crisis, he didn't have the authority. Well, in government, you don't ask for permission. You ask for forgiveness. That's one of the real roles of government. You do not ask for, if you ask for permission to do things in government, you never get anything done.